All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. It's Lucid. And uh, yeah, we've got some fun stuff. Uh, I would say the last couple episodes have been marked more by kind of failures we've had than by successes. Uh, nevertheless, our strategic position kind of continues to improve. And that's a really good way. I, you've, If you've watched the channel, you've heard me talk about this before. But that is a way I like to look at positions in a game is like how many mistakes you have to make in order to ruin your position. Uh, so in that way, we're in a very good position because we can make huge mistakes like we've been making. I wouldn't even call the things we've been doing mistakes. They've been kind of calculated risks um, that we knew might not work. But we want to force our opponents to respond to them. And they've responded, and they've kind of spanked us in various ways. Um, yeah, there's certainly things we could have done. Like, if I if I had, like, perfect vision of how things would play out, what was inside forts, etc., uh, I would have not stormed some of these forts. And I would have waited until we had mass flight and, uh, you know, whaling winds and stuff and, and some of these fights. So, um, anyway, so the story's partially been about that, but also, uh, we have Nexus up, and, uh, you can tell by looking at this, there's a bunch of really powerful spells getting cast. We're wishing for gems, uh, we are, uh, casting Leprosy, uh, we're casting Flames from the Sky. Leprosy goes really well with Flames from the Sky, um, but yeah, we killed 108 units. I think this is an Erythian army. Yeah. And then uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the results of, of these things. Uh, and then we cast Record of Creation. We found a Cave of Clouds, which I think is one air. And then uh, we cast Ghost Riders, uh, Raven Feast. We, we've got three Curses of Blood now, so we're doing three Vampires a turn. So our Blood Economy is actually pretty huge. Uh, I, let's see if this is a representative turn. Uh, we'll call this 40, 60, 80, 110, uh, and then we'll call this 140. So about 140 a turn, so it's not really three vampires a turn. Uh, but this might be a little bit low as for a haul. And then we have a bunch of battles, so let's, let's go watch. Um, so we have an army here that hits PD. We've got an army here that hits PD. <clears throat> Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we run into a, a Wraith Lord squad. Let's see if we can manage to Soul Vortex them. What is going on with the battlefield? I don't think I've ever seen this before. That's wild. What is that? Uh, anyway, okay, so Wraith Lords are coming. Pillars of Fire. Was that Vortex of Unlife? Yeah. Soul Slays. Okay, the PD, not the PD, the Thralls have been killed. Now we've got Ghost Champions that are joining the melee. Oh, nope, he gets killed by Drain Life. So I don't think we permanently killed any of these. Uh, Arithia has a Lich here. Let's see what this Lich was doing. This Lich could have just been here to block, um, like, light raiding. Did he train life himself? How did he kill himself? Oh, Wither Bones. That'll get you. Yeah. That will get you. Uh, okay, so we're hitting mostly PD. This is a light raiding squad here. So this is, I believe, on top of their throne. So we'll double check. I think this is on top of their throne. And I think this is actually sparse because this is the army we hit with multiple flames from the sky. And what we've put here is a small bait squad with uh, this Saramancer with enough gems to cause a gem burn. So uh, we're going to get to see what all he's going to cast. But ideally, uh, they'll get four turns off before people jump back here. There goes Storm. I don't know if we're going to get so lucky as to get things like Elemental Spam, which would be amazing. There's Army of Gold. Yeah, these guys have a lot of buffs on them. 
Oh, well, we don't see Will of Fates yet. Oh yeah, there goes Undead Mastery. Ooh, feels so good. There's not, like, tiers of gem burning threshold. You know, it's not like you can, like, sort of gem bait. So yeah, we've we've now gem baited a lot. <laughs> you can see pretty much a ton of a ton of battlefield enchantments have gone off. This guy's weapons of sharpness, mass regen. Um, <coughs> they've got uh, he's a fairy queen. We haven't seen fog warriors, strangely. Um, but yeah, and then the undead mastery. Oh, there goes fog warriors. Another Undead Mastery. Yeah, so that was a, a life well spent. Thank you, Mr. Saramancer. Yeah, we probably burned... So we spent four of our own gems, and a Saramancer, and some chaff. But probably everybody here got their gem burn, gems burned. Like, I doubt there's any gems left over. Saw one pearl so far. Okay, they're not really loaded up with gems, though. It's just a few casters. And there's a lot. I'm not going to click through them all. My guess is probably we burned 30 gems. No, probably 40. I think there's 40 gems. Um, this Undead Mastery... Well, no, it could only be 30. Undead Mastery, I think, is 7. Uh, maybe it's 6. What's Undead Mastery? It's 7, yeah. So they cast that twice, that's 14 right there. And then pretty much all the other buffs. Those were probably... Now, it's possible some of these were with temp gem items. In which case, that kind of makes my uh, my gem burns suck. But uh, I don't think he was rocking too many. Okay, where were we? Not here. Okay, this was the gem burn. Um, the, the sad thing is we did donate five worms to the Arithian cause. Uh, okay, more things. Small army with tomb worms raiding here. This is a like a little holy two priest, I think, or holy one priest. Uh, a white mage. This is our um, sickle farm still going with Ulm. And uh, worm mage gets uh, yeeted here. Okay, so this is really cool. So this is an Ulm Arco battle. I believe this is the first of the Fort Storming battles this turn. Yeah, look at all these Storm Demons. Storm Demons are so good. And then a bunch of fairies or little sprites. And uh, some Demon Knights. Love me some Demon Knights. And then Fiends of Darkness. My only kind of complaint if we would call it that about this army is I think you want the demon knights to just run in turn one or something like it's I, one thing I found is that like if you mix special there's a hmm, what's the right way to say it there's a lot of different timings at which the units are going to engage here like these guys are going to be really slow um, these guys are going to jump in really quickly and uh, the Fiends of Darkness will suffer a lot of attrition. The uh, Knights will then run in second. And they'll also be taking some attrition potentially from the Storm Demons. Uh, and then the Storm Demons will come in last once they run out of ammo. Well, not last, but after the melee troops. So this isn't really a, a problem. I think it's fine. And I think there's value. Like if you run all Storm Demons, then you can get countered just by stuff with enough shock resistance. So I, I like the idea of mixing it up, but I don't know. I think like little things, like maybe having the knights run in first. That way, the 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 fiends of darkness will land about the same time. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how this actually happens. So yeah, some fiends of darkness. I think these were uh, these were probably. So this was only a few. It was like five. This is probably to deal with being gym baited. Uh, like if, if somebody jumped out of the fort or like to cast Wind of Death. So these guys were actually s intentionally sacrificial. Okay, we've got a lot of buffs coming out. And we've got Darkness going up. So these th Fiends of Darkness start getting sick. 
uh, stats here. So 21 strength, 16 attack, 16 defense. Very, very strong. And then, of course, people they're fighting get stat penalties. Okay, and then the fiends land. Looks like they killed something with Phoenix Pyre back there. Uh, there's a few Wraith Lords bopping around. The the Demon Knight. Where are the Demon Knights? Oh no, they've already, yeah, they've made it through. Okay. Oh, he's got mass flight cast. Okay. So the, the Demon Knights are mixed in all over the place. And the Demon Knights are, by the way, noticeable for being kind of the heart the, the tankiest of the demons. Uh, but perhaps most notably for having fear built into the chassis, which is really strong. I think most of the deaths here for uh, for Ulm are going to be friendly fire, if there's any. Um, yeah, he lost a couple fiends of darkness. I mean, he lost hardly anything. So, and he killed a pretty surprising amount of stuff: an archdevil, a heliophagus, a lich, uh, a muse, which is a arco hero, a tart. Two Wraith Lords, nine Mystics, yeah, 200 troops. So, very clean win by Ulm. I think that was this one. Yeah. Um, next, we've got two Fort Battles. Let's see if we manage to have any success here. I think there's not much in this one. Oh, no, there is. This, I believe, is the fort. So there's the, the fort with the alteration site, like the throne that we're trying to take from Arco. I believe this is the fort right above it. We were sieging both of them. And I thought there weren't there wasn't as much inside this one. I, I could be wrong. It could be a different fort. Uh, because I I'm not here looking at the map. Um Brigger Mortis and Wailing Winds. So this is really important. This means as the battle goes on, we're gonna have a much better chance of. Uh, of winning. See some of their squads routed already. Uh, apparently we didn't find the need to put up darkness. I don't know what's going on. I should have scripted that. Uh, but we've got lots of worms. I think these guys are all fatigued out too. Oh no, they're not. Are these slaves? Oh, dude, they have so many slaves. They might have done too many slaves and not enough masters. I just don't, I didn't see a ton of spells coming out. I was expecting way more. Yeah, these guys are all slaves. That's kind of another thing, too, when you're fighting Blood Vengeance, is you kind of need more masters. Because as your masters cast evocation-type spells, they're going to kill themselves and therefore, like, lower the burden on your slaves. So I, you know, how much you account for that, I'm not sure, but I think you want to account for that some. You definitely don't want to be, like, light on masters, which I think is what we have here. We'll see if, if we, we'll see if we can kind of get a sense of how many. I mean, there's so many mages. I wish it told you. I mean, there's definitely some masters, but we can. There's 26 slaves. Thirty slaves. And then not everybody's a master. Like some of these guys don't have the paths to communion up. So if we look at that battle, oh my god. That's so many mystics. Holy crap. But most of the mystics can't enter the communion. I'm not the, the Orphic mystics. These guys all can, the, the normal mystics. So... Yeah, I I mean, probably, I think it's one in six of these can. So there's, there's probably ten of the Orphic mystics that can enter communions and, and all of these guys. So it's probably only like five communion slaves with 30... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, five communion masters with like 30 communion slaves. That's like way too high for a fight that's going to be this hard, I think. Like way too high of a slave to master ratio. 
Um, but yeah, we didn't lose that much. We only lost uh, 75 Tomb Worms and a Horticulturalist. I got a fair amount of items as well, which is kind of nice. Um, God, that's so many mages. Let's watch this again. And this time we'll focus a little bit on what the Mystics are doing. Um, he might not have been expecting Mass Flight either. Because these guys are very good skelly spammers. They uh, they have reduced fatigue because of spell singers. So over the course of a long combat, they'll make a lot more skeletons than a normal death too. <clears throat> so if I got jammed up in the gate here, which I think is what he was relying on, um, things would be very bad. But now these guys are all in melee, so they're probably going to get torn to pieces. Yeah. Like... Yeah, my worms are all over his mystics. So I think a lot of this fight going as well as it did for us uh, comes down to mass flight uh, and to him not really expecting mass flight. So uh, basically, if he was in a box formation or something so that the Orphic mystics were better protected, uh, it would be a lot tougher because he would then get all of his mystics killed by dust to dusting my dudes. And 60 Orphic Mystics is a lot of dust to dust. I'd much rather kill them by just uh, biting them, you know, without having to eat a dust to dust. So, um, that's nice. But yeah, you can see there's not a ton of important casting going on. Yeah, the Orphic Mystics die really quick. And then the Communion was unbalanced, so... Uh, that was that, and we've taken that fort. And the next up is we have a fort in the cavern realm. And I think this is where his god is. So I think we're gym baiting. We're casting vulnerability. Some things have jumped back here. Okay. So we've successfully gym baited. Now the gym baiting, sure, it's going to cause some minor gym, uh, gym spend. It's also going to keep them from doing things like elemental spam for whenever I choose to have the real fight. Um, and it's going to keep us apprised of whatever they're doing for their script. But you can see they've cast all the buffs. They've got fog warriors. They've got life after death. Uh, they've got protection bonuses. Uh, I think they've got army of gold. Uh, don't have will of fates yet, but... Their setup on dead mastery doesn't look like we were successful in, in baiting that out. At least I don't think we were. We'll, I'll double check, make sure we didn't have an Undead Mastery come out and somehow I miss it. Yeah, no. The uh, the Flying Demons came in. Uh, we got 120 Pearls from Nexus, so that's not very much. We should be sending half of those to, uh, to Ulm. So there we go. Um, yeah. What else? Defense. Defense. Uh, got a white mage back. I'll kind of show you. This is one of the important provinces here. So you can see we've got a fair amount of tart stuff happening. We've got two tarts coming out. One is a death four with a uh, scepter of dark regency and a skull face. The other is a skull face and a hat. I think we got a death five. There is a chance you can roll death five for a Saramancer. It's very unlikely, but we've gotten one this whole game. So um, I believe that's... <coughs> I believe that's this guy. So uh, we're happy to have them. And then we have a few tarts running around. And I, this is my... Um, I've kind of broken tarts up. These ones here uh, are feeble-minded. Uh, well, this one isn't. So we, we would technically move him up here. Because once they're no longer feeble-minded, I put them up here in this, this queue. Uh, they will have other afflictions, but not being feeble-minded. The quick way to te uh, to check is you look at the MR. If the MR is 12, then they're feeble-minded. Um, if they don't have any afflictions, they're also not feeble-minded, obviously, too. So that's uh, the other way to check. Uh, hold down the tab key to flash up the, the hearts. So, yeah, you can see we have a lot of tarts left to, uh, to commanderize. Um, and we're using nature gems for it, even though I'm trying to bank nature. So that's that kind of sucks. Like, we're using nature for gift of reason. Um, and I'd rather not. But it there's just no way to justify doing the pearl version when you're doing a, a wish casting and uh, you have arcade nexus. Because 
it's like you get double slapped for uh for divine name which is the astral version of gift of reason by the way for those of you who don't know gift of reason takes a normal unit turns it into a commander which in the case of tarts is going to give it paths um so uh yeah because with uh, any pearl spent, you don't get a Nexus rebate. So we miss the Nexus rebate, and then with Wish, it makes it where we can take pearls and turn them into more of a different gem type. So, uh, yeah, definitely don't want to be doing Divine Name. But sadly, that means we have to spend our very precious Nature Gems. Um, we also have a... We're going to be getting a Golem... I'm not sure. Let's take a look over here. So this was the fort that we just won. This was the... The important uh, victory here. Uh, and we've gone and put this fort under siege. Which... Because there's basically... Basically, there's hard stuff in here with, like, Master... You know, they cast Master and Slave at us a hundred times, it felt like, the last time we fought in here. Um, and they're, they're not going to, I don't think, bring the Wish Casters outside. Because, uh, A, it'd be easy for them to die. But B, they want to have them casting Wish every round. Um, and then... Uh, anyway, this this also is a dinky little force. It's not going to win. But we're going to go ahead and storm here, see if we can take this. Um, and that will hopefully secure us taking this throne in the coming turn. So um, we're going to have Wailing Winds with this Golem, you know, with the Har Harmonica. We're going to have Mass Flight Access. Uh, we're going to have Army of Gold. We're going to have uh, Blood Rain. So just Blood Rain and Wailing Winds all of a sudden makes me feel like way better about taking this fight. They'll have the Golem, which is Astral Nine, which is going to be slamming Master and Slave. But I think we're okay for that. I'm not, that's not really what's worrying me, you know? And the Golem's not going to run from Wailing Winds and Blood Rain, which is why I mention it. Um, Cthulhu will probably run. Pretty much most of our other stuff is going to run. Um... And then we just have to kill the golem, and that shouldn't be too hard. Um, so yeah, we're we're moving into position to take this. Now, uh, the other thing is that, and I, I don't know if we're doing that now, but we as soon as we take this, we want to be set up to um, to take advantage of this alteration bonus site, the Tower of the Deformer. Uh, and we're going to need golems, and I'm not exactly sure where my golems are. But I might just empower them when I get there. I thought I was empowering them here earlier. It doesn't appear so. Um, we're also, by the way, if uh, Astral Corruption gets cast, we're like pretty set to deal with it. We've got so many Solus converted like little mages. Um, it'll slow us down on some things, like we can't really do Tartarian Gate or things like that. Um, and things like Gift of Reason we can do, but we won't do it with Fairy Queens. So we'll have to like make more boosters and, you know, f fairy out Nature 1 guys and throw a ton of boosters on them. So it'll be a pain in the ass, but something we are basically prepared to adjust to and deal with. Um... And I think the global situation, yeah, we've got Gale Gate and Nexus, and then Arco has the rest of these. Gift of Health, Eyes of God, Mother Oak, and Well of Misery. Um, yeah. So I think we're going to call it for that turn. Let's, I'll get one more in here. All right. So this is turn 87. A report from the Cavern Realm. Oh my goodness. A storm of fireballs appeared out of nowhere, struck the army located here. 344 units were hit, and of those, 62 were killed. Among those killed was Contuzillus, the Lizard King. That's too bad. And then we lost a vampire here. That's not good. Uh, did we storm? Okay, we stormed just with a tiny little squad. Uh, having this vampire killed in the overworld army might have ruined this. Because, do we have Wailing Winds? I don't know why we're storming this. <laughs> Such a bad idea. I was looking at it. I mean, there's a chance we win. I think we need Wailing Winds. We, we have There are things we have that mean we could win. Like, we have Mass Flight. So I think we could win. We've got Army of Gold. 
we have rigor mortis. There's a lot of reasons we could win. And these guys on advance and cast are going to be able to blow up his god, who's a tart. You know, they can do train life or disintegrate or things like that or bane fire. Um, so we have a good shot at winning. But I'm not really a believer. <laughs> now, we, we probably could win. And if we don't win, it's going to be such Pyrrhic, such a Pyrrhic victory for Arco. That's probably okay. But it's just like we also could just... I think I've got somewhere... I know I've been air empowering some death mages. And I'm not exactly sure which ones I picked. I'm, I think I'm probably trying to do it with liches. So here's a death air mage. Why are you researching? I need to put things on you. Like a skull face and a... See, this is... And it's air too. This is a huge missed opportunity for me. This is me playing very badly. Like, this guy needs to be here. And I need to take one of the skull faces from the tart factory. And uh, one of the skull staves. And stick it on him. And then he can do... Wailing wins every fight. Like, what am I doing? <clears throat> For great shame. But yeah, mostly I'm not planning on doing it through tarts. I I think I've been empowering. But tarts are another way to get the death hair cross path. Um, all right, let's go through the, the events here. We've been mentally attacked. So it was a mind hunt attempt that failed. The vampire lord also got mind hunted but failed. Uh, we got some gems. Streams of Hades, we're casting that once or twice every turn. Um, here's our Drowning of Sarmancers to turn them into White Mages. Some Magic Phase Attacks, we've got a Wolf. Uh, this is probably... Wait, is this a Horror Harmonica Golem? No, this is our Pokemon Golem. And uh, Pokemon Golems are pretty good. There's a Wraith Lord here, though. Uh, it does look like we killed him. But we did not soul slay him. Uh, so that's that. Uh, this is uh, our, uh, you know, our conversion ritual, basically. And then uh, let's come down here. Yeah, we got a lot more slaves than the previous turn. So this uh, 20, 60, uh, 80, um, 110... 140, uh, 170, and then 200. So, yeah, that's a bit more. I think that's more normal. Um, there's the white mage. This just PD. Let's see if we have any interesting battles. Uh, I think we'll wrap this episode up, too, by... Oh, my goodness. Oh, I didn't talk about the Arithia situation at all. Okay. So, shit. I'm going to actually go back to the previous turn. Okay, here's the previous turn. I want to talk about the Arithia positioning, because I, I'll show you the fights in the coming turn, but you won't really understand what's happening. So, um, I had a big army here, and he had his army here, and he knew that my army was going to go on top of the fort, but it didn't. Um, I flames from the sky dim, and I gem baited him here. And he came and took this fight and got gem baited and stole some of my worms. <clears throat> and, um, and so you can see my movement for this turn. My movement, there's a, there's a bunch of different moves I could make. I could go on the throne. I could go back on this fort. I could... Uh, combine these armies here and go on this fort. Um, that's actually a pretty good move. The problem with that move is he could combine these armies here and defend this fort. And um, the context to remember here is we lost a pretty major battle against Arithia recently. And um, now after losing that battle, we didn't go hide in our forts and we weren't like, oh no, don't come kill us. You know, that wasn't what we did. Uh, we have taken major armies. We have been playing aggressively. We've been pushing kind of the borders. However, we don't want to overplay our hand. And um, my advantage is not going to be having the strongest armies. It's going to be by having the most armies. The Arithian advantage is going to be by having the strongest armies. So what I need to do is I need to put severe and irresistible pressure on more places than Arithia has armies. 
What does that mean? It means I need to get major armies, not raiding forces. I need to get armies into his back lines. I need to get armies into this fort, into these forts down here. I need to get armies all through here. Um, I need to, the more pressure I put back here, the less he can defend up here with. And once he starts taking any losses, those losses start becoming irreplaceable. So basically what we're going to be doing is just shuffling troops this way. These guys are going to be moving up to defend. So it's going to be a kind of like a weird counter raiding turn. These guys are going to be moving up to defend. These guys are going to be moving over here. And this is, you know, a semi-proper army. Um, I don't know why we didn't give this, give this guy a water lens too. But uh, anyway. Um, yeah, so that's what happened this turn. Let's go look at the next one. Okay, so this is turn 87. Um, all right. I think this was the... Where was the Erythia? Okay, here we go. So this was... Wait, did I change my turn? This looks like it was on a... Or it looks like it was on a fort. Okay, wait, hang, hold up. Oh, this was here. Okay, so Arithia was trying to knock me off of this Arco Fort. But we have like a big army, and this is not a big army. Now, he's doing a bunch of things which are really good. Um, he's doing so Dragon Teeth, which is really good. Uh, it gives you these really nice high MR, high protection skeletons. This is a great way for Arithia, <clears throat> uh, for Arithia to do their mages. It's also going to kind of fatigue their mages out, which is kind of good if you don't want them to blow up. Um, however, the, he just doesn't doesn't have enough stuff. This is like 20 mages, and they're doing things like casting Gifts of Heaven and Flame Eruption. They're going to be blowing the fuck up. And he's got a front, like, he has a bunch of summons, which are really good. He just didn't have nearly enough stuff here. Like, his strategy was right, his scripting was great, but it's just the quantity of stuff. So, and this is sort of leading to what I was talking about, too, with, like, um, like I have more armies than him, right? So, uh, I'm putting pressure on more places in the map than he feels like he can respond to or defend. But then it's like, okay, we can't just give Satis stuff or they're going to run away. So there's a ton of pressure on them to, like, take fights that maybe they shouldn't, like this. Right? Because it's like, okay, well, if we give it to him, then how are we going to take the fort back? You know? So, um, yeah, this was, like, 20 mages and 100 troops, or, you know, 80 troops. And not quite even. Um, and uh, and yeah, but we had 220 sacreds and a tomb king and, uh, you know, we had rigor mortis and yeah. This, there was no way this was going to work. Um, maybe if he had twice the gems on these guys and they could have done twice as much. And they had the fatigue, which we didn't check to do like twice as much summon chaff. It could have been closer, but like we, I mean, we did lose a fair number of worms. Yeah, maybe if somehow he was able to do, tw he had all this, but was able to do twice the number of summons. That actually might have kept some of the mages alive, um, you know, because they would have passed out instead of casting spells. But uh, yeah, I mean, that might have worked. It would have been more expensive, right? Because like a lot of times too, the first, the second cast is more expensive than the first. <laughs> Uh, for example, like if you want to summon a fire elemental and you're fire three, you can put one gem on them and they'll be able to summon a fire elemental. But to summon two fire elementals, you have to put three gems on. So, um, yeah, it, it, it kind of ends up being more expensive. And the reason for that is the first cast is going to use the maximum number of gems that it can uh, to keep fatigue within a range. Now, it doesn't mean it will always for all spell. <clears throat> for all spells use the maximum but if the fatigue <coughs> i think if the fatigue is over like 50 it'll keep adding gems uh, up to the maximum which is your path level uh until you've i think it's something like that it's like 
if it's over 50 fatigue, it's going to keep adding gems up to the maximum to reduce the, uh, the fatigue cost. The net effect of that is, yeah, if you if you want to use two gem using spells, uh, expect to be pay a very heavy gem price for the first spell. Which got, anyway, but I think maybe if he did that, there's the chance he could have won this. Otherwise, it's pretty tough. Fortunately for us, there was nothing here inside the Arco Fort, <clears throat> so we just kind of rode through and and killed the PD. Um, so that was here in the Pasture of Wisdom. Then. Uh, a great hawk with some eagles raids. Cool. Uh, we gem bait Arcocephale here. This is again. Where does God go? His God was in here the, the turn before. I wonder if his God went to protect the throne that has the alt site. Oh no, here's his God. I'm just blind. Yeah, man. What a thick lady. Look at her. Live action Little Mermaid. She's not a Little Mermaid anymore. She's an old crone. Uh, okay. So that was this one. Oh no, that was this one? Yeah. So just another gym bait. I don't, yeah, we didn't get anything. Let's take a look. I don't think we got anything extra special out of the gym bait. And we're still getting a lot of these spells cast, but yeah, there was this was kind of like the very minimum return. That wasn't really a great use of the gym bait. And then we're storming here in the Pasture of Wisdom. Oh, wait. No, that was that uh, fort. We already saw that. Okay. So that's basically it for this turn. Um, we're probably out of time. So I'm going to go through. We're going to talk real quick here about uh, basically the orders we're given. We're going to keep sieging here. We're going to storm with the golem and this guy, and we're going to just summon horrors and see if we can clear out some of this chaff. Probably, I, looking back on it, it's probably not going to work because I think the, the astral nines are going to soul slay stuff, but there's a chance a golem lives, uh, like lands next to one of the astral nines and like causes them to rout, um, especially Cthulhu. Um, we've also got this kind of surrounded now, so Arithia can't really come mess with us. Uh, I think we're records of creationing this province as well. Um, let's take a look at kind of what we're doing over here as well. Um, we've got, this is Arco, their cap. We've put it under siege. Um, we have not yet popped it, so we'll be popping that here shortly. There's a lot of troops in here, but I don't think there's a tremendous, like, I don't think this is the majority of his power. I think... I think the strongest province Arco has left is this province we've been pinging here um, that he would probably honestly get completely trounced if he tried to ride out. Um, and yeah, we're going to be trying to storm that this turn. So that's going to be probably the most exciting thing next turn is going to see if we can finally win this here. Um, and in case it doesn't, we're moving a replacement army, as I like to call them from the Bogarus days. Uh... This is our, our first replacement army that we're moving over here on top, so that will be kind of nice. Um, have we got we have not gotten wise and moved this death at, uh, death air tard out, so that's unfortunate. Um, yeah, but there's not much left with Arco. There's a few things here that are really alms left to take. These aren't really uh, for us, um, though. It's understood by Almanai that when Arco's dead, uh, that we'll be fighting. But uh, as much as I can, I'm going to stick to the terms of our agreement. You know, like, I think if um, if this... It's a kind of weird thing, too, uh, to go on a bit of a, a, a tangent to rabbit trail, is that in real... You know, like, I'm not a nap breaker. I'm against it. I think it's a bad... I think it's a... You're more likely to lose the game if you nap break regularly. Um, or even semi-regularly, you know, like I think it's a bad strategy in most lobbies, though it is lobby dependent. Um, certainly there's advantages to like nap breaking to throne rush to win a single game, but I don't know. I, I think, so maybe there's an argument for doing it sometimes, but I think the people, some of the people with very high win rates in the community nap break from time to time. Um... But I think people that have the highest win rates don't. And not that's not true. 
I think of if you were to look at the people with the highest win rates in like medium and advanced games, intermediate and advanced games, I think it's I think most of them don't nap break. Anyway. Um that being said, I think in real life you do, right? Cuz in real life like you're only like imagine you're marching off to war you're going to be risking like hundreds of thousands of soldiers lives and you have a not an aggression pact you're not going to like announce hey it's ticking down like if you're going to fight somebody like ideally you don't make agreements you're planning on breaking and maybe right or maybe you do you know to to stab someone in the back you first have to get behind them um but when real lives are at stake you don't announce like a nap tick down and then you have like a war start on a certain turn that's not how it works you would just attack right i i think i think if you were to actually like have a nap tick down in real life uh like everybody like all the other countries would laugh at you um but that doesn't mean breaking a non-aggression pact doesn't have meaning a lot of times they'll do like terms on the non-aggression but like it ends after this many years or something like that so it's still like very frowned upon, I think, breaking a non-aggression pact. Like people won't want to talk with you anymore. Um, but there can be like more diplomatic cover you give yourself. I think the way you don't break a non-aggression pact in real life is you would like, at, you try to negotiate for better terms so that you can keep it. And then when they fail to give them to you, then it gives you kind of a cause I belly, uh, you know, it gives you like justification for breaking it in a way. Um, and that way people might still negotiate with you and things like that in the, the world stage. But yeah, in no, in no way in real life do you do a nap takedown. I think nap takedowns still make a tremendous amount of sense in Dominions, by the way. But um, what I was saying, why I started going down that rabbit trail is in the case of like this land, I think like if I were kind of playing, uh, you know, if somehow this were like, the stakes were equivalent to real life. We wouldn't let Ulm like finish Arco and then turn and fight us. Cause we've got most of Arco's forts under siege that we're going to try to take the last forts. We've got a lot of forts under siege. We haven't taken yet, but we've got this fort, this fort, this fort. Um, so these three forts under siege, and then this one kind of just nominally under siege here. Um, and that's pretty much all we're going to be taking from Arco. Um, there's a chance we might be able to try to take this, which I don't think is uh, really covered in the spoils agreement. Um, yeah, we could come try to take these. But uh, these are definitely for Ulm to take. And I think in like a super... So like if the stakes were higher, if it were like closer to real life, we would probably try to speed up and like try to take this stuff before Ulm inevitably betrayed us, betrayed us, or not betrayed us, but you know, that would be the next war. They would, they're certainly going to declare war on us as soon as uh, Arco's gone. Uh, but that being said, Ulm and I are buddies in this game. Um, we've been very friendly the whole game and uh, we've been talking a ton pretty much every turn. There's no way I'm gonna like try to not honor all, I mean, it's not like if he didn't do that, I wouldn't honor the terms, but um, yeah, it's just, it's not going to happen. So, uh, anyway, uh, the important thing is we've got all the forts under siege we need, but there's, uh, Ulm is a little slower. Um, they're doing a good job on the rating war, though. Uh, we'll look at score graphs here as we... Oh, we don't have all of them, but we'll look at ours. So provinces, they're on the rise. Forts, we're looking pretty good. Income... We're surprisingly unpoor, given how horrible our scales are. Uh, gym income, looking pretty solid. Uh, this one we're probably number one in. Income, we might be number one by now, but probably just barely. Um, research, pretty good. Dominion, pretty good. Rising, rising faster. We had like a really good last couple turns. Army size, you can see we got knocked down a little bit, but it's been popping back off. Um, I don't know where the other nations are. My guess is they're down here. This probably is like number two. So 
if like four bars is number two, we make four bars in like seven turns. So uh, we got, yeah, a lot of armies. But uh, we don't have a ton of mages. Other nations definitely have more mages than us. So um, that's really the, the cost of, of losing armies is if they kill all our mages. We can replace the worms, but it's like losing, you know, the gear and the, 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 the white mages. Because our Sarmancers get blown up by, like, flames from the sky. Um, so we kind of need white mages for combat, or we have to have a fair amount of gear on Sarmancers to use them. Um, and also our, our Sarmancers get blown up by, like, assassins, a bunch of things. So, um, anyway, I, I think that's it. I think um, if, if we zoom out a bit, I think that Arco is in a position where he would have to win so many battles now to even just get some kind of like okay concession at, like to get some weird peace agreement because i've got bait he has to like kill a whole army and then kill a whole nother army and then like same thing for this we're going to be having a lot of reinforcements coming in um so arco i think is basically boned um yeah they're in a bad way uh arithia they've got a huge army on this throne we don't really want to engage it we've popped this fort so we're going to be storming it we're really fortunate that this army wasn't sitting here because this army would almost like if this army was here, it would almost certainly kill us this turn. We wouldn't be able to take this fort, but for, uh, it looks like we're going to be able to. Um, so we're, we're still taking infrastructure in this theater of war, but mostly with Arithia, we're kind of dancing, right? If we come over here and look at the this part, you can see, you know, they moved up here to consolidate. They would have killed the army if we moved it here. Um, they had a, you know, there's a chance that this army, which moved up here, it could have come down here. You can see they were patrolling. They probably were patrolling all of these forts with forces that probably would have killed, um, like any army we attacked with. So we're basically dancing with Arithia, trying to keep pressure on them, trying to get entire armies into their back lines and trying to spread them thin. Uh... Yeah, while also being a bit unpredictable. Um, so this army is now going to go into their back line. This army is going to kind of come back this way because um, there's really not a lot of safe tiles. Like this isn't the safe tile to move to. This isn't a safe tile to stay in. This isn't the safe tile to move to. So we don't really have a lot of good moves for this army. So we're just going to kind of pull back. And what I want to do is, and we'll see exactly how we do it, is I'd like to commission another army over here, which you can see we've got piles of worms, and again put two armies in the theater here, threatening, challenging infrastructure, maybe even have a like a giga army, you know, like some army, especially once I take some of these Arco forts and I can free up like the Queen of Air Elementals and stuff, um, and then some of my other like, you know, important gear, like, you know, good har harmonica and stuff. Um, once I can free up some of that gear from the Arco War, uh, put together kind of like a giga army, you know, like 400 worms, 500 worms, uh, more mage support, and uh, potentially start actually trying to attrition down and take fights with some of these big Arithian stacks. But importantly, uh, we want to commission another army, get them ready to go, while this army now goes into the backside, where I suspect between Arithia having a big pile of stuff here and them having a bunch of stuff here. I don't think there's anything in the Erythian heartlands. So we're gonna be looking to get an army back here. And this army is not amazing, but it's gonna be able to one turn pop a 500 well strength fort or two turn pop a citadel. So that's important and good. Um, but yeah, that's basically the strategy executing um, with, with each of these players. So. Um, what I expect to have happen is in the next probably seven turns, Arco will get put down, um, and then Ulm is going to declare war on me, and then we'll have to fight Ulm and Arithia. So that'll be kind of fun. Um, but I think Arco still has a few more fun battles in them, and Arithia definitely is not to be trifled with here. So uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the next one, and until then, take care.